Welcome to Hedge Fund Tips with Tom Hayes. I'm Tom Hayes, and this is your 156th video cast, 146th podcast for the week ending October 13th, 2022. Well, that which we have been waiting for and talking about and positioning for has finally started to play out today. We talked about the excessive pessimism in positioning, in sentiment, uh, in everything else was going to cause a rip your face off rally. Uh, it just started today, and we're going to talk a lot more about that, uh, some of the catalysts and uh, how to move forward. But the key and most important thing is we rallied on bad news, because if it's a good news headline, tomorrow you get a bad news headline, you give it all back. Today we rallied on a horrible CPI number, but we actually rallied on something else, which is more important, which we'll get to in a second. But first thing, it's been an early day. I was up at 4.30 to do CNBC Indonesia this morning. I uh, want to thank Andy Shalini and Yuda Yudist, Yudistira for having me on CNBC Indonesia. We're going to get to this uh, in the middle of the podcast. I uh, just wanted to thank them. I want to thank uh, Mitch Hawk and Zoltan Sarani for having me on Benzinga this afternoon. We're going to cover that today because uh, this was uh, midday. You're going to find this stuff extremely valuable. As a matter of fact, I'm not going to repeat myself twice, so I'm going to embed both of these in because I just recorded them today. And by the way, I'm going to be on CGTN America tonight at 8 o'clock, <laughs> if that's not enough. But I uh, want to thank uh, Anuran Mitra for including me in his Seeking Alpha article. I want to thank Sarashi Sinyal and Ankika Biswas for having me in their Reuters article today. And the key quote was, there are no sellers left. So uh, we'll start out with a couple quotes of the day. Warren Buffett, most people get very interested in stocks when everyone else is. The time to get interested is when no one else is. You can't buy what is popular and do well. That's from the master himself, Warren Buffett. And uh, coupled with that, for everyone uh, uh, trying to troll me on Baba, uh, stay away from negative people. They have a problem for every solution. Uh, and, uh, you know, this is just a waiting game. We've got three imminent catalysts. We have the CNC, which is going to happen in uh, this weekend, where Xi will take his third term. Uh, we'll see if we get some policy change coming out of that. But more importantly, we've got Alibaba earnings coming up. Uh, number one, that, that'll be uh, probably uh, first or second week of November. We have the audit uh, to deal with the delisting issue. That should be eight to 10 weeks from mid-September. So we're looking at potentially as early as uh, mid-November, probably December. You have the dual listing, which is going to get buyers in from mainland China before the end of the year. Uh, and you have the most important thing today in my view, is the dollar is down while the market's up. So if that dollar continues to fall, we're going to continue to see, uh, 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 start to see emerging market flows. So um, next, uh, Buffett, opportunities come in frequently when it rains gold, put out the bucket, not the thimble. We agree. So here was the key catalyst. Uh, the futures were up this morning on the news that uh, UK was going to walk back that fiscal policy to uh, to cut taxes, uh, which would kind of stabilize their bond market. Uh, so that was good. Market was up. Then the CPI print came out worse than expected. We are going to uh, I was going to spend a lot of time on uh, inflation, but uh, Jeremy Siegel makes my points much more articulately than I can as it relates to inflation and money supply, particularly M2 money supply. So we're going to cut that in right here. Uh, but what I want to cover really quickly was this came out from Reuters exclusive midday ECB staff sees lower rate peak than market sources say. So um, the staff put terminal rate at 225 at their at a meeting last week and this memo was released. Uh, the market has it at 6%. So what you're seeing and, I, and you're going to see that in the Bazinga is uh, just as we had talked about, bank by bank, they're rolling over and they're blinking. And they're not blinking because they said, oh, yeah, we were too hard. They're blinking because things are breaking and the credit markets are disciplining them. As we told you was going to happen, it's starting to happen. So, uh, And that's why you're seeing the market do what it does today. So um, 
So that's that. Let's go over to Professor Siegel of Wharton and take a listen on everything you need to know about this, the inflation numbers of the last two days right here. Let's bring in our headliner today, Professor Jeremy Siegel. He is of the Wharton School. He joins us now. Professor, I was so happy when I, I heard that you were booked today uh, because I so remember our conversation the last time when you were all riled up and animated about what the Fed was doing, making the argument that they've already done too much. For those who may have missed that, I want you to watch yourself and we can talk on the other side. Here's a clip of you from a few weeks ago. Makes absolutely no sense to me whatsoever. Way too tight. We do not have to get anywhere near that level to stop inflation because all the inflation is basically stopped. So, Professor, doesn't this report today vindicate the Fed? Does it vindicate the Kashkaris and the Mesters and all those who've said it's not close to a peak? And doesn't it prove you and others wrong? I don't think so. Let, let me tell you why. Um, let's go to the housing sector up seven tenths of one percent. That is totally ridiculous. Housing prices by every indicator are going down, not up. Even rentals. Yes, they're going up from contracts. They're going up from a year ago. But talk to the people on it. They said, I can't get the jumps that I got earlier this year. That should be minus 0.7%, which, by the way, wipes out core inflation for September. Let me give you a really interesting fact. The distorted way the government does housing statistics. From March of 2020, the beginning of the pandemic, until this summer when the housing market peaked, the, all the best housing indicators, case show or the government indicators, housing was up 40%. What do you think the CPI housing factor was up? 11% because of the lagged way it put the rising prices in. What does this mean? We had so much more inflation over the last year and a half because of the inflation wasn't in the, that housing sector. And now when the housing is going down, and by the way, I click housing prices fall 10 and 15 percent and the housing prices are accelerating on the downside. Will you see that housing sector in the core negative next month or the month after that or the month after that? No, you'll continue to see that positive. It's imperative that the Fed recognizes it, that that is not an indicator of what the real rate of inflation is. And a second really important point, and, and I think Ian Shepardson really hit it. When did the Fed start tightening? In March. Mm -hmm. Is that supposed to work in six months? Look at the Fed exploded the <clears throat> money supply by in 2020, the year of the pandemic, by more than any other year in the last 150 years. Did we have inflation in 2020? No. Did we have inflation in the first half of 2021? No. Then we started in the second half, and the Fed said it was temporary, so it didn't do anything until the March of this year. <laughs> All right? So monetary policy, you know, we started tightening in March. Are we supposed to see that in the core now? No. What do you see the tightening of the monetary policy in? Just like what did you see the loosening of the monetary policy two years ago in? You see it in the housing market. You see it in the financial market. And you see it in the commodity market. All of those exploded in 2020, which showed you that inflation was definitely there and going to go into the official statistics. Right. And what have happened to those three markets? They've gone down. When will it get into the core? Months, if not years down the line. So, uh if the Fed waits for the core to get down to 2% year over year, it'll drive the economy into a depression. Totally wrong. I'm not at all surprised by the number because the number is ridiculous. It has no meaning to what the actual rate of inflation is. So in the housing, which is almost 50% of the core rate, I is know the most distorted of all. So your take last time was coined by some uh, 
of the Fed, they know nothing 2.0 after Jim Cramer's famous one in, in 08. I have Leisman, Steve Leisman, right in front of me here, who's been listening intently to everything you're saying, who noted himself what Shepardson of Pantheon had noted earlier today as well. What do you make of what the professor said? I mean, you can listen to what he says and, 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 and suggest he... I have a clarification, which is, Professor, is, is, is your bigger problem with the pace of rate increases or the level? And I'm interested, in, most importantly, in your sense of what level you think is appropriate for the current economy right now. Um, we'll just leave it there. I think we're very near that level, maybe another 50 basis points. I disagree with Larry Summers. We have to move way ahead of the rate of inflation, which, by the way, is much less than the year-over-year -year official statistics actually show. And the major reason for that is that over the last 20 years, we've had a tremendous decline in real interest rates around the world and in the U.S. So a particular interest rate is much tighter today than it would have been back in 1980, 1990, or even 2000. So I think we're at a very tight moment now. I'd give them another 50 basis points. But, you know, if they do 75, 75 and then move into 2023 with continual move, they're, they're going to go overboard. I mean, we absolutely I, I have a lot of sympathy with what the professor's saying. Well, a lot of I'm people trying do. to what I'm trying to do is think about a way that the Federal Reserve as policymakers could systematize the essence of what he's saying, which is to take a series of market signals, for example, recognizing that the rent numbers are badly lagged. We've reported on that and said that quite a bit. Using commodity prices, I'd, I'd be a little bit careful about using money supply because that gave a very false signal in 2008. Maybe the professor wants to come forward and tell us how we can use that. Um, th that was something that Greenspan rejected back in 1993. Um, and I do think for reasons of financial stability, as well as this idea of lags, which is probably the only thing we really know about monetary policies that affects the economy with the lag, there is a reason for the Fed to get to a level that is at least somewhat restrictive and to pause there. Unfortunately, the way the Fed has laid out its case right now, which is based upon the data as published, I mean, maybe what the metaphor for what the professor is saying is the Fed is driving the car, has its foot on a gas pedal, sees the brick wall in front of it and is not taking his foot off the gas. I guess in this case, it's the brakes. Well, look, I mean, Jeffrey Gundlach has suggested the same as well, that they're going to drive right, in, right yeah. into a wall because they're, you know, they've got these big glasses on. They can't see exactly. It's all fogged up. They can't see exactly the, the right things yeah. to look at, like the professor insinuates, and then they drive right, right into a wall. So, Professor, you're not the only one who, who has these views. We had Mark Lazary on overtime yesterday, of course, uh, the you know, investor from Avenue Capital who said this, and I want your reaction to this on the, on the other side as well, as well as the gangs. Let's listen. I'm not really a big believer in what the Fed is doing. I think at the end of the day, you've got this huge issue that is going on right now where every time you keep raising rates, um, you're pushing the economy closer and closer to a real recession. So what are you doing? You're trying to tame inflation, which I get. And but if I lose my job because we're going into a recession, so instead of paying a little bit more for goods, now all of a sudden I've got no job and then the Fed is going to turn around again to start lowering rates. So if I was the Fed, sure, you can raise it one more time, but I'd slow down because I think there is a real risk to this economy going into a real recession. Wow. Well, I mean, Professor, this isn't a guy who's even talking his own book, right? He, he, he finds opportunity in times of stress, right? And he's suggesting that they're, they're going too far. The minutes yesterday say that the Fed's far more concerned with doing too little rather than too much. Because they did so little, you know, the pendulum swings, oh, my God, I made such a bad mistake on one side. I really got to be tight now. I, I would like to come back on Steve Leisman about the money supply. The money supply, which is the one that Milton Friedman monitors think is important, is M2. And that increased very little Good. in 2008, 9, and 10. Ben Bernanke's uh, quantitative easing just went into excess reserves of the bank. That is not part of M2. It, we did not explode the money supply then at all. The explosion of the money supply was 2020, and Friedman said 12 to 18 months later, you're going to have bad inflation from that, and bingo, we had it. And since March, 
the Fed has screeched on the brakes and the money supply has fallen. So that gave you an absolutely correct signal two years ago. And I'm worried that this decline in the money supply, but by the way, is one of the biggest in the last century um, in terms of, of decline. Of if they keep that up, it's going to also produce a bad outcome for the economy. So, so I think you've got to look. I, I think money is an indicator. I am very upset that the Fed continuously dismisses that when that proved to be an exact right indicator for what we're in today. Yeah. So, Steve Weiss, I mean, you know, the, the professor's made his case. You, um, I know, are, are on wholly the other side of, of what he's he says. Yep. To me, the, the biggest risk is letting inflation continue. And we just don't know if we'll or not. And the Fed and and I'm not trying to say that this is absolutely the right thing to do. What I'm trying to do is take a look at all the facts that I see them. And one of those facts being that Powell overstayed his uh, his view when the fl when the actually the freshman was exactly right, uh, that inflation was transitory. So they're not going to make that mistake again. And I believe that they've got the appropriate tools to handle a recession and that frankly while going to recession may be an issue what's so much more damaging is the 70 percent of the people in the u.s that live paycheck to paycheck that don't work in the jobs that we work in that the professor works in that aren't able to meet ends meet so if you're going to err on the side of caution do it for them number one number two we're in a much different market environment than we were during prior periods of inflation. And by that, I mean that because of all the financial products out there, because of the quant funds, because of all the different financial instruments out there, the, cent the market participants can take any movement by the Fed in terms of giving a nod that they're going to pivot and turn into an easy money environment. We've seen that with the 10 year. We've seen that with rates where they're able to go out and drive the bond market yields lower and loosen economic policy. Mm -hmm. So at this point, what I'm saying is you've got the Fed on one side with their tools, which are not that effective as they would have been in terms of the, the strength of those tools against market participants. So they've got to make sure that we don't have an easy money policy. If the market turns around, and goes up 30 percent and stays there, then the Fed sort of failed because the market action is another monetary tool. So let's do this. Let's take a quick break. Professor, stick with me. Um, I know we want to get everybody else involved in this conversation, too. We'll do it next. You've been working from home but your roommate just took up percussion as a hobby. Jeremy Siegel of the Wharton School to continue our conversation. So, Professor, forget about what you want to happen, what you think should happen, how clueless the Fed is according to your view on things. If they remain on the path in which they suggest they will, what does it mean for stocks? Where, where would we go? I, I, I do want to answer that, but I also want, we, we just discussed about Who's going to be hurt by the inflation that we have? And it seems like Powell wants to balance it on the backs of the lower income people. He talks about, you know, we have to crush the wage increases. Uh, a few people talked about the wages were reported 830, just like the price, falling three and a half percent behind inflation. People are trying to catch up. How can they be a cause of inflation when their wages are going up less than inflation? He, it sounds like he wants to make the job market so bad that no one can ask for a, way, a way, raise and, and we're going to put all these people out of work. I don't think that that is speaking for the lower income people. I think the current policy is very negative. You have inflation in the pipeline. Let that core inflation, partly because of statistics, partly because of bacon, go through and then aim in the long run for your 2%. What does this mean for the stock market? If they over tighten, Bigger probability of recession, obviously. Uh, you know, I mean, what, what do we have? 236. That's way too high for next year. If we have a bad recession, you know, maybe it'll be down 20 percent for 200. And then maybe 2023 will be 200 and then we'll jump back to 224, 240 and then and then 240 again. I mean, if you do the math, 
on two years of bad, really bad earnings, you know, we've already taken care of that in the market decline. History shows the market always declines far more than it should. Every single recession over the last 100 years. Well, listen, NBR has been computing recessions for 150 years. Every single one, the stock market has fallen more than justified by the future path of earnings. Under, understood. I mean, I mean, and so, you know. Again, uh, again, but you can make the same case, and there's some do who, uh, who say on, on both sides it, it does, right? It, it, it overshoots to the upside. Um, right. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it, it takes it over, an escalator it up and the elevator it's more down. I hear you on that. On but, both sides. Yeah. You know, jo- my good I friend Josh Brown in. The Professor, Nobel Prize let, me, let me get Josh Brown. That. Professor, let me get Josh Brown into the conversation because I know he's been patiently waiting to get in. Josh? <laughs> I, <laughs> I forgot I was on the show. I felt like I was just watching it. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, Professor, <laughs> Professor, I actually want to ask you a question. Um, have people forgotten, in your estimation, have people forgotten that if you're truly worried about inflation and you think inflation is going to remain high for at least the next year or two, uh, I feel as though there's a lack of awareness that historically stocks and REITs are the very best inflation protection on planet Earth. Better than gold, better than treasuries, obviously better than cash, better than pretty much anything else you can do. That reality, and you've written uh, an entire book about it, That reality does not appear to be reflected on my screen. We have had more down 1% days this year than in any other year save two in history. Uh, Why aren't people more aware of stocks being the cure um, and not just the the near-term pain from from something like pernicious inflation? Yeah. Well, uh, Josh, you're you're perfectly right. The... the the evidence is overwhelming, uh, incontrovertible, that in the long run, stocks completely overcome the inflation and your returns after inflation are the same. I mean, all the inflation we've had over 200 years has come since World War II. Price levels up 25 times. And the real rate of return is 6.5% a year after World War II. And it was 6.5% when there was no inflation for 100 years before. So absolutely. But there's three phases. When money pushes in, stocks run race ahead. And then when the Fed tightens, that's when they go back. And since the Fed delayed so long and they're tightening so much, this is the most painful of that second phase of that. Yep. And that's why people are questioning, do you have stocks real assets or not? And then finally, when they succeed, it goes back up and completely overtakes it. The so long run evidence is there. We're in that middle phase. And it's more painful than ever because the Fed delayed so long. Professor, I'm going to I'm going to let you run. I so much appreciate your conversation. Well, hold on. Steve Leisman is, is raising I, I, his hand. I, I He's making need, faces. I, I feel at me. Need he needs to quickly to provide the other side here. of the story here uh, <laughs> it, 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 because nobody else is at the moment. And and that's as follows, Professor. The, the Federal Reserve would argue that it does not have any control over supply. The only uh, control it has is over the demand side. And it must create slack in the economy by raising the unemployment rate. The other thing the Fed would say is that we had a round of stop and start when it came to raising rates. And that was in the mid-70s. That did not break the back of inflation. And what they're most worried about is not today's inflation. It's tomorrow's inflation becoming entrenched. And I just think it's important for that to be on the table as two forces that are motivating Federal Reserve policy right now. Well, first of all, I think it, it, we don't have that because they we never saw the commodity prices go down. We never saw the house prices go down. Um, and and we, a lot of other things were not going down then in their stop and start policy. In particular, their money supply never went down. It just continued to expand and expand. So I do think we're in a, diff, a very different mm-hmm. position. And by the way, Jay Powell himself said once, and we know that it works with a lag, but he's almost acting like, I'm, I'm going to keep on tightening until, with my eyes, I see inflation. Steve, wasn't that the problem that we've gotten into two years ago, that they waited until they saw inflation before they acted, rather Fair than enough. all the other indicators that said things are going to get worse? Yeah. Professor, um, good stuff, as always. So much appreciate. Okay, we're back. So I uh, want to cover this. I was talking with my friend Tiho. Uh, and we go through, uh, share a lot of different signals that we both look at. Uh, the one that I found and is empirically proven correct is that insider buying 
uh, is signal without noise. Insider selling is, no, is uh, noise without signal, meaning uh, buys tend to be uh, predictive uh, empirically and uh, sells uh, don't tell as much. People sell for a whole slew of reasons. And what I like about this is it goes sector by sector. So you can see there is some lag in this data, but you can see where insiders or the smart money have been buying aggressively on the weakness. So uh, the S&P uh, CEOs have been buying uh, aggressively. So this is overall uh, insiders, this is CEOs, this is CFOs. Um, but I, I like the CEOs in particular. Uh, and the S&P, they've been buying this weakness uh, just like they were in 2020, uh, just like they were in 2015, just like they were in 2011, just like they were in 2008. Um, financial services, they've been buyers of late. Banks are now back in the hole. They're looking attractive. We'll see bank earnings tomorrow. Uh, real estate, they've been buying aggressively. Real estate sold off on interest rates. I think that's the right move. Uh, energy, they're not buying. So all the retail people who didn't want it in 2020 when we were pounding the table, they're now buying it while the insiders are not. That tells you everything you need to know. Uh, utilities, no real uh, marginal buyers. Healthcare, they have been buying. That's biotech included in there. We like that. Um, industrials, not much buying. Uh, communication services, we're seeing buying. So you've got, uh, I think you've got Amazon in there. I think you've got Meta in there, etc. cetera. Uh, basic materials, no buying. Everyone's chasing it up here, uh, not the insiders. Uh, consumer defensive, uh, slowly buying staples, modest buying, nothing to write home about. Technology, you're seeing the CEOs start to buy aggressively into the weakness and consumer cyclicals kind of mixed little buying. But it gives you a feel for where the smart money is going. We like that very much. I'm gonna go ahead and flip over before we get into the next stuff here. Uh, actually, let's go through these Twitter things. I thought Jason Gopert did something good on uh, uh, today. At the height of panic buying today, more than 45% of all NYSE securities traded on an uptick. That's the second highest amount in the last 25 years on the day after the S&P. 500 set a new 52 week low uh, suggests short covering and you can see that was right in the March 2009 lows when they were doing that 2011 lows 2016 lows 2018 lows uh, sorry 2020 lows and today this was the perfect setup you'll hear in my Benzinga uh, um, interview the leg sweep uh, completely textbook perfect uh, if you remember from the karate kid when we were talking about Wells Fargo uh, well, there you go. Some other highlights from this week. Uh, Putin tells uh, Grassi we're open for discussion, for dialogue. As I said, no one is positioned for any upside in this market, and that's why you got 800 points up today. Uh, here's from my friend Tiho. U.S. dollar sentiment is perfectly portrayed in Barron's recent cover. Uh, usually when you get this on the cover, it's the, it's the signal of an inflection and we're gonna see the dollar stop going up. We've been talking about it for weeks with the commercials, uh, but this kind of puts the cherry on the cake and it's nice to see the dollar weak today. Um, another one, Brainerd favors mo Fed moving in data dependent deliberate manner. Brainerd sees tentative signs of some rebalancing in job market. Brainerd says Fed attentive to risk of further adverse shocks. So they're watching uh, an economic crisis. I talk about that a lot with Mitch. You want to pay close attention to that. Uh, and Evan's current market climate reminds him of December 2018. Well, what did they do in December 2018 after they threw the market off the cliff? They blinked. Uh, first, first, they had to backstop it and uh, create the liquidity, which may be something going on today. And then they had to uh, have uh, Powell walk back his autopilot comments that caused the crash in the first place. Um, Carl Quintanilla, two Federal Reserve officials begin laying out a case for exercising caution and in raising interest rates after policymakers last month telegraphed plans to continue lifting rates at their fastest pace in decades. So Brainard was one of them. Uh, Tiho, this builds on um, Siegel's stuff that, that you heard. Uh, you cannot fix supply chain problems with rate hikes. The current inflationary period isn't caused by excess demand like the 70s. CPI could keep on rising despite more hikes. Perhaps central bankers should have done nothing to a man with a hammer. Everything looks like a nail. 
so I talk about that a lot more with Mitch, which we'll hear in a minute. Um, and then finally, this wage price spiral is really getting out of control. This shows 17 consecutive months of negative growth in real hourly wages. That's uh, so, so basically uh, what they're afraid of, of embedded inflation is a wage price spiral. Well, there's no wage price spiral because people have been getting screwed. Their, their wages are not going up as much as uh, goods are going up. And now they want to fire people. Uh, you know, that's Powell's intention to get people to lose their jobs, which makes absolutely zero sense. I think the vast majority of people would rather pay 25 cents a gallon extra for milk than have no job. Um, uh, this was the uh, seasonality for the year that seems to be now playing out according to schedule. Um, and this is from fact set the 12 month PE ratio for the S&P is 15.8 below the five year average of 18.5 and below the 10 year average of 17.1. Uh, for those who need translation, stocks are cheap. Uh, so let's move on. I want to cover first off, I think it'll be really instructive. Uh, this morning's segment from CNBC Indonesia, it really covered everything in terms of how I'm thinking about positioning, sentiment, etc. And sure enough, you'll see how the market took off finally after laying that foundation. So listen in here. Uh, I think you'll find it valuable. Dan untuk membahas terkait dengan hal ini, kami sudah terhubung bersama Chairman and Managing Member Great Hill Capital, Thomas Hayes, langsung dari New York, Amerika Serikat. Hello Thomas, how are you doing? Hi, nice to speak with you. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Uh, how do you see the U.S. economy at present? Is it actually still doing well compared to the 2008 global financial crisis when the world was entering into recession? As Biden and Yellen said that the U.S. economy is not in a recession, despite of the data shows that U.S. economy is in technically recession. Well, I agree with you that we're technically in a recession. Uh, I disagree with the idea that it's anything close to 2008. It's like uh, night and day. We're, we're just coming off a period of seasonal weakness. In the United States, September tends to be the worst month of the year for the stock market. Uh, and we're in a similar situation that we were in in June. Going into earnings season, sentiment was very pessimistic. Earnings ex expectations were very, very low. And, and analysts were calling for a 20% reduction in earnings revisions. And none of that happened. As a matter of fact, that sparked the summer rally. People weren't positioned for it. And I think we're going into a similar situation here. We have the S&P 500. Uh, it's now down 22.5% for the year. But you're seeing earnings ex expectations only brought down by 3.5%. Uh, and I think you have the exact same setup going into earnings, which start tomorrow with the big banks. Uh, analysts are again are calling for earnings to come down 20 percent uh, and I think that the bar for earnings is set very very low people are only expecting 2.5 percent earnings growth for Q3 uh, and uh, I think what they're going to find is earnings growth is a lot higher uh, and they're not positioned for it now as it relates to 2008 I will say managers are just as pessimistic as they were in 2008 in terms of their positioning. Uh, when you look at the Bank of America surveys of fund manager surveys, uh, expectations for a recession are the highest since they've been since April of 2020. Uh, and before that, uh, March of 2009. Both cases, when pessimism levels got this high, the bottom in the stock market was already in the rear view mirror. In the case of uh, 2020, the stock market lows were in March, and in the case of 2009, the stock market lows were also in March. So I do think that there is a lot of positioning uh, for a, a, a bad situation, but uh, I just don't think the economic supports it. I think uh, the consumer balance sheet is healthy. I think corporate balance sheets are healthy. And I do think uh, that the biggest risk we face right now uh, is the Fed overdoing their policy. And amidst of high inflation, followed by the Fed's rates hikes, how big is the probability of U.S. economy hit by recession and stagflation uh, started at the end of this year? Yeah, so I, I do think it, you've seen GDP estimates come down 
to 0.2%, uh, if you look at the Fed dot plot. So it's interesting, last year when GDP estimates were 3.8% for this year, uh, the Federal Reserve thought that it would make sense to have a Fed funds rate at uh, you know 10 basis points. And now that GDP is collapsing uh, and going to be basically flat for the year, they think that it makes sense to have the Fed funds rate at 4.6%. So it's like a dog uh, chasing its tail. Uh, like Winston Churchill once said, generals are always prepared to fight the last war. And my biggest fear is that they're going to overdo it and have to walk it back. We've already seen instances of that in Europe with the ECB having to go into the market and buy bonds for the periphery like Italy. We've seen it with the Bank of England uh, having to walk back and buy bonds, uh, buy, buy gilts. And we've seen it from the RBA in Australia hiking less than expected. And I do think the Fed will be next. And there are a few reasons that they're going to have to walk this back and maybe not move as aggressively as they intend. First and foremost, inflation is already rolling over. Even the PPI numbers you're seeing, they peaked in March of this year. This morning, we're gonna see the CPI numbers. I think we're gonna see a similar story. Um, the other thing that we have to keep in mind is Chair Powell has this fantasy that he wants to be Paul Volcker and crush the back of inflation. Uh, for every 1% that he increases the Fed's funds rate, uh, it adds $285 billion to the U.S. deficit. Uh, so far, we've added $1 trillion a year of interest expense with these Fed fund rate hikes. Uh, and uh, while Volcker had the luxury to do that when debt to GDP in 1980 was 30%, uh, Chair Powell does not have that same luxury because our debt to GDP levels are 122%. So, uh, right now, that interest expense is, is approaching uh, the line item of Social Security. So it's becoming uh, very onerous. And I do think that uh, they're going to have to maybe one or two more hikes and then pause. And the market is going to start to sniff that out well before they pause. And we're going to see, I think, a recovery in stocks well before they, they actually make that pause many months before if history is any guide. Uh, so, uh, you know, if they don't do it on a proactive basis, I do think like in England, like in Europe, the credit markets will force the Fed's hands to ease back uh, when, when municipalities, when governments, when businesses can't refinance, uh, the credit markets will fall, force the policymakers' hands to ease up on the tightening policy moving forward. Uh, Harris, as you mentioned earlier about the benchmark of S&P 500, uh, well, JP Morgan Chase says that the outlook for the benchmark S&P 500 could fall 20% from the current level and could be much more painful than the first. So how do you perceive this outlook? Yeah, I think that just embodies the level of sentiment in the market. Uh, I'm always skeptical of people that come on TV and after the market's already crashed, 25% say the market's going to crash another 20%. These are usually the same people that uh, before the market went down uh, were very bullish. So you have to be very, very, very careful. I think uh, investors have a tendency to get carried away with the uh, pessimistic sentiment. And you are seeing it in managers. I referred to the Bank of America Global Fund Manager Survey. Uh, managers have 6.1% cash. That is higher levels than the great financial crisis lows and the pandemic lows. So the one thing that no one is possibly positioned for is any good news. If we get a geopolitical favorable headwind, that could be a positive. If we get earnings better than expected, uh, that could be positive. If we get the Fed and central banks to uh, ease up, that could be a positive. If the official CPI numbers, which are lagged data from 30 to 60 days back, start to show a deterioration of inflation, that could be good news that no one's positioned for. And what happens when positioning is this extreme, the pain trade is usually in the other direction. So right now, everyone's positioned for more downside. You just look at the data, that's how they're set up. If you get any positive news, no one's positioned for it. So the minute you get that uh, shock type of initial rally, uh, you get a massive amount of short covering. The first, first buyers have to be the shorts because they lose money the quickest. And then from there, institutions start to put serious money to work off of the sidelines because they run career risk of being uh, underweight 
uh, into the end of the year during okay. a period of seasonal weakness. So, uh, so we're pretty optimistic going into the end of the year. Mm -hmm. What an interesting review has, but we have to continue our dialogue after this commercial break. Dan jangan kemana-mana karena dialog bersama dengan Thomas Hayes, Chairman dan Manager dari uh, Member Great Hill Capital akan kami lanjutkan usai jeda. Tetaplah bersama kami di Call Signal. Sajikan informasi terlengkap seputar dunia ekonomi. Minggu ini kita akan melaporkan kepada Bapak Presiden. Kami rangkum berita pergerakan pasar saham dari dalam dan luar negeri hanya untuk Anda. Bursa saham Eropa hari ini sumringah di awal perdagangan. Saksikan Evening Up, Senin sampai Jumat jam 5 sore, live di CNBC Indonesia. Simak tips terlengkap dalam mengelola keuangan bersama para ahli. Masyarakat banyak lakukan pembelian secara langsung, seperti contohnya sektor retail. Dapatkan informasi seputar ragam produk investasi serta analisis resikonya. Perekonomian domestik sebenarnya relatif masih lebih robas ya, masih lebih terjaga. Saksikan Invest Time Senin dan Jumat jam 6 sore live di CNBC Indonesia. strategi jitu meraup untung dari para pelaku usaha di berbagai sektor. Melesat hingga 16,2 persen dalam sepekan terakhir. Serta simak berita terkini dan terlengkap seputar sektor real dan analisisnya bersama para pakar. Kalau satu fasilitas yang memang di kita persiapkan untuk pelaku usaha di Indonesia. Saksikan Profit, Senin sampai Jumat jam 10 pagi, live di CNBC Indonesia. Ikuti perbincangan inspiratif bersama Kepala Lembaga, Direktur Jenderal, Menteri, hingga Duta Besar Negara Sahabat. Serta simak informasi terupdate seputar kebijakan pemerintah. Retail business coming to Indonesia, no? Saksikan Prime Words setiap Rabu jam 2 siang di CNBC Indonesia. Anda kembali menyaksikan closing bell dan kita lanjutkan kembali dialog bersama Chairman and Managing Member Great Hill Capital, Thomas Hayes. Hayes, we will continue our dialogue as we know that global equity markets have been volatile in recent sessions as investors have worried about the impact that aggressive rate hikes by central banks would have on slowing economies. So what should investors do when global economy hit by recession and uncertainty? Should the, uh, we do the rebalancing portfolio or just take the momentum in stock market? Yeah, I think uh, certainly you want to look at rebalancing the portfolio, uh, buy more of what's down and sell what's up. Uh, I do think that like Warren Buffett says, you want to be greedy, greedy when others are fearful. Uh, and but in periods like this where there's high volatility, you want to start to buy only the highest quality businesses, the businesses that you know with certainty, one year, two years, three years down the road, not whether the stock price will be up, but whether the business will be doing more business two, three, four years down the road than the business is doing today without, without question. And sure enough, sooner or later, the stock price will follow that business. The, fund, the, the stock price will always catch up with the fundamentals over the long term. And we're looking at franchises that are absolutely no-brainers. You don't even have to think about, for instance, Disney. Disney is a huge business. It's down 55% off of its peaks. There aren't many chances in history that you're going to have maybe a couple in a generation where you can buy Disney at a 55% discount in the market. And the stock market, as you know, is the only place when they hold a clearance sale, 
no one shows up. <laughs> you know, when things are marked down, when merchandise is marked down, usually in the, the department stores, everyone goes and buys everything. In the stock markets, it's, it's not the case, and that creates the opportunity. Then you look at businesses like J.P. Morgan, the best bank in the United States, probably the world, down 41%. Uh, they're going to report tomorrow. They kick off earnings season. Uh, that's another high-quality franchise that we think is worth taking a look at at these levels. And if you buy a little bit today and it goes down in a couple of weeks, you buy a little more. But you take a long-term outlook over the next one to three years, and I think you're going to be very happy. Then you look at Boeing. Boeing just got an order about a week ago from China Airlines for up to 24 787 MAX Dreamliners. Uh, they operate in a duopoly, so they have pricing power with Airbus. The demand for business travel is really coming back aggressively. It's roaring back uh, like people haven't expected. We saw over the summer the leisure travel came back, but certainly the business travel has roared back, and earnings are expected to grow 20% a year over the next five years. Uh, you can get that business at a 71% discount off of its highs. This is not some small cap or micro cap uh, speculative stock. This is Boeing. <laughs> There's two businesses like this in the entire world, and you could buy it at a 71% discount, and they can't give it away. It's, it's one of these times in history that you get caught up in all of the negativity okay. and all of the sentiment, uh, but the, the highest quality businesses in the world are on sale. Hey, else, the minutes meeting of the Fed shows that they are expected higher rates to stay in place. So how does uh, this hockey stance will impact on the stock market, especially in emerging markets? Well, they don't know. OK, so this is the guidance that they're giving. If you remember last year, uh, you know, when they, they had expected that there would be no inflation this year and there would be no rate hikes this year. So now. Uh, that you have inflation, and even though inflation is coming down, they're saying that rate hikes are going to keep going up and that they're going to stay up for a long time. Uh, the minute inflation rolls over, uh, they will potentially adjust that policy maybe on a lagged basis. Now, uh, in the short term, the strong dollar has been bad for emerging markets. I do think it's setting up the stage for one of the greatest opportunities over the next three to five years to get exposure in emerging markets uh, and aggressive exposure. And the one key factor that I look at is the strength of the U.S. dollar. What I look at the commitments of traders report, which comes out every week in the United States from the CFTC, Commodity Futures Trading Commission, and it shows me what is the positioning of the commercial hedgers. This is the most important because the commercial hedgers are always early and they're always right. And the commercial hedgers right now are the most short that they have been the U.S. dollar. I know everyone thinks the U.S. dollar is going to go up forever, and you're seeing it on cover of Barron's and some of our major publications. But the commercial hedgers are always right, and they're the shortest since 2020 peak, the 2017 peak, the 2015 peak in the dollar, the 2013 peak, the 2009 peak, and the 2006 peak. So maybe... The commercial hedgers will be wrong for the first time in history, and the dollar won't eventually go down in coming months as it has every single time that they've been this short. But our bet is that the dollar is going to start to peak in coming months. And once that happens, that's your signal to start aggressively investing in emerging markets, the highest quality for the next three to five years. I think it's going to be a tremendous trade that includes Indonesia. That includes China for certain. You know, China is the only large, large economy in the world right now that has been aggressively easing policy all year, fiscal policy, monetary policy. Uh, and the impact of that easing and that increased money supply has not yet been felt because they've been in a zero COVID policy since April on and off. It's slowly getting better. And even if they stick with the zero COVID policy, the virus eventually dies out on its own. So uh, I do think after the China National Congress this week, we're probably going to see maybe not an official walk back of zero COVID, but in terms of their actions starting to ease that up. And you're going to see some real, real acceleration in the Chinese economy, which is going to help many emerging markets. Uh, and then once we see the Fed, uh, the markets start to sniff out that the Fed is almost done with their tightening, uh, the market will bottom a, a couple of months before they're done. Uh, and the dollar will start to weaken. And that is your signal to uh, to start to aggress uh, invest aggressively 
uh, in emerging markets, and we're pretty excited about that opportunity. Okay, well, what an insightful review. Thank you for joining us virtually. Thomas Hayes, Chairman and Managing Member, Great Hill Capital. Have a great day. Yeah. And we're back. So now we're going to go through some key articles of the week. Uh, investors fleeing to cash like it's 2020, Bank of America strategists say. Well, that's all you need to know. Uh, and that's why you see a day today like you're seeing, uh, because when everyone gets to one side of the boat, you want to take the other side of the trade. We've been teaching that for three years now. And sooner or later, you know, sometimes I say these things and it happens like overnight and it's like, wow, it, he's a psychic. Other times I say, look, these, you know, analysts, uh, you know, uh, amateurs deal in absolutes, professionals deal in probabilities. I've, that's been my theme for three years. Uh, but sooner or later, all these things work out. And uh, and this time will be no different. So um, we've got uh, the China National Congress on the 16th, which is uh, Saturday, uh, over the weekend rather. So uh, maybe we'll get some some positive catalyst from that. Um, and we're going to see who he puts in charge of the economy. You've got Han Zhang, Hu, Chuna, Li, Liu He, and Wang Yang. That's quite a name. I, I could imagine picking up girls at a bar. Anyway, uh, <laughs> but anyway, Wang Yang uh, was, if he's chosen, uh, he's known to be very market oriented and selecting him would reflect a drastic policy change. So keep in mind, it's an easy name to remember, Wang Yang, if that's the pick, uh, I would assume that would be extremely bullish. Uh, but, you know, all of this is really kind of noise until the dollar comes down. So um, keep an eye on it, but don't lose sleep over it is, is really what I have to say about that. Alibaba's cloud opens up new Hangzhou campus the size of Google Silicon Valley headquarters. Uh, they're not doing this for show. They're doing this because of the thesis I laid out in detail last week, how uh, Alibaba Cloud could be worth 200 billion on a standalone basis. Then you add the cash, you're at 270. Then you add the China Commerce, you're at 470. Then you add uh, any type of growth, you're you're above 500 billion. And uh, right now, the stock's trading at 220 billion. So, um, uh, excuse me, you're at 500 dollars a share. Uh, you are at um, you know, some of the parts it gets you up to that over time uh, is the play. But the, the growth is the cloud. So basically, you had a peak operating income of 16 billion. Uh, you add 10 or 11 billion from the cloud. Uh, you're talking 60% more operating income than when the stock traded at 319. That's with peak multiple. If you do trough multiple, you, you know, cut 500 in half, you're at 250, uh, which is... Um, you know, I think conservative and I think will certainly play out uh, over the next few years. Uh, and I think more likely than not, we'll wind up closer to a peak multiple. And that's where we really get the juice and have the multi, multi, multi uh, returns that we're looking for from this and deserve after sticking through uh, this, uh, you know, chronic uh, uh, Chinese water torture for the last year or so. Uh, but uh, I think we're, we're, we're coming to an inflection here. Nobel laureate Paul Krugman treat, predicts a housing market slump and an exports decline and suggests the Fed has already done enough to conquer inflation. Uh, I agree with that. Um, but you heard from Jerry, Jeremy Signal. Retail inventory glut is about to get ugly. I cover that with um, Mitch, uh, uh, which you're going to hear in just a second. And then um, Glum Hong Kong dealmakers pin hopes on China Congress to revive economy and IPOs. Uh, so let's let's see what happens this weekend. That could be the first catalyst. That would be nice and, and overdue. Trust prepares to abandon key tax cuts amid market turmoil. That was the news this morning. Treasuries yelling worried about loss of adequate liquidity in U.S. government bond market. What did I say over and over? Eventually, the bond markets will school the policymakers, and it's already happening, and that's probably why you're seeing what you're seeing today. Look at this. Hedge fund positioning against the CPI report was at five-year lows. They were all shorting in the hole, and they were right, but they were all crowded on one side of the boat, and that's why I love the market rallying on bad news today. Uh, and when you listen to how I explain inflation with Mitch, 
you're going to understand that they really have no choice. They're going to have to just let inflation run above trend uh, and um, uh, deal with it because the alternative is uh, much worse. So let's go over to Money Mitch on Benzinga. Here you go. All right, let's bring him on here. How we doing, Tom? Doing great. How you doing, Money Mitch? Oh, excited. I mean, this these are the days that we live for, right? In the market, uh -huh. right? The ones that make your hairs come up. The ones that you're like, looking at the tape. Well, this is exactly what we got. And we, we definitely started the day off with a bang. It might have been no a bang case. lower and then a bang higher after. But does today's price action really seem like the capitulation low that many have been calling for? Well, I'll tell you what, capitulation or not, uh, you know, I've been pretty consistent the last few weeks talking about positioning, talking about sentiment, how managers, uh, if you look at the Bank of America survey, had the highest cash since the great financial crisis lows since the pandemic lows, highest uh, expectations for a recession since April of 2020 and March of 2009. Both of those cases, the bottom of the stock market was in the rearview mirror. And I felt like a broken record on a lonely island. I got to be honest with you. And uh, today it looks like that's playing out. And I think what we saw this morning uh, was that <laughs> there are no sell sellers left. I mean, I'm sure you saw some of the stats on the amount of put options that have been bought in the last you know, one or two weeks. Everyone's buying insurance after the house already burned to the ground. And uh, the same people coming on TV saying that we're going to get another 20% 20 per 20 correction after uh, we've had a 25% correction are the same people who were telling you that cash is trash when we were at all time highs and to keep buying assets before they rolled over 25%. So you just have to recognize through cycles uh, what are peaks in sentiment and peaks in positioning uh, and try to get yourself positioned. But the hardest parts are the turning points because you, know, you can be a few weeks early and it's just, you know, it's like watching paint dry waiting for a thesis to play out, waiting for, for the tide to change and waiting for everyone to chase into the positioning that, that you're waiting patiently with. So I think today was a positive start. I think the setup going into earnings is also very pessimistic, very much like the end of June before Q2 earnings. If you remember all the analysts coming out, estimates are coming down 20%. Earnings are going to be horrible. And sure enough, estimates held up. They were down 3%, not 20%. Earnings beat materially, and I think you've got the exact same setup with a low bar set going into earnings. Uh, we'll start tomorrow with the banks. Obviously, their banking business, investment banking business, is going to be terrible. I think a lot of that's priced in. Uh, I think uh, net interest margin will, will look a little bit better, uh, but I think overall the earnings season will beat expectations, and I think guidance will be less pessimistic than people anticipate, uh, and, and analysts will look through the, uh, the strong dollar headwinds. Now, I know that the CPI report came in uh, definitely hotter than expected. Um, a lot of people were looking for the sevens. They were looking for the sevens. Now, what caught you by surprise in the CPI report? Well, look, it, it was a complete train wreck. Like the number couldn't have been any worse. And, and that, that's why I love this rally today, because, you know, if you rally on good news, it's one thing. So you get a, a rally off of a headline um, and then the next day you get a bad headline and you're back down. Rallying on bad news is a completely different story because it means you've exhausted all the sellers, meaning everyone was positioned for the apocalypse. The problem was the apocalypse was in the rearview mirror because the market is a discounting mechanism that looks to six to nine months ahead. So here you got the worst news you could possibly imagine and the market rallied. Now, the market rallied, number one, you, you've exhausted sellers. But number two, uh, which has been part of my thesis, and I know you, you follow a lot of my stuff, uh, is that, um, you know, uh, all of these policymakers have these noble intentions uh, and they want to be the next Paul Volcker. But when push comes to shove, the credit markets uh, are in charge. And we saw that in the uh, with the ECB having to go back in and buy uh, Italian bonds. We saw it with Bank of uh, England having to go in and buy gilt. We saw it with RBA in Australia having to... Uh, uh, raise rates less than they anticipated they would have to. Uh, they went 25 versus 50. And then we saw today there was a, uh, a, a Reuters headline out that uh, shows the ECB expected terminal rate is uh, 225 versus uh, what the market was anticipating was 6%. Uh, 
Uh, and I think what's happening is people are coming to the conclusion that uh, inflation, you're just going to have to live with it. We're going to run above, above trend for the next three to five years. Uh, it's not the end of the world. This is supply driven uh, more than demand driven. In the 70s, it was demand driven, and that's why it was persistent and entrenched. Uh, today, you have the underlyings rolling over. You have the commodities rolling over. And if you look at uh, owner's equivalent rent, that's going to be in the numbers for the next six to 12 months. I mean, housing prices are already coming down, but owner's equivalent rent works on a lag basis. So I think policymakers have to come to the conclusion that uh, getting an economic crisis by tightening into a weakening economy is going to cost a lot more than just allowing inflation to run slightly above trend for a few years, like they did after World War II, when they took they inflated away the debt and took uh, took our debt to GDP ratio from 120 down to 63 percent in just uh, five years, from 1948 to 1953. So we borrowed a ton of money to fight a visible enemy in World War II. We borrowed a ton of money to fight an invisible enemy uh, called COVID in 2020. And now we're going to inflate it away. And it, it's going to be above trend inflation. And the, if the policymakers are smart, they'll continue to talk hawkish to try to anchor long-term inflation expectations, with they, which they've been very successful in doing. You've got five-year inflation break-evens, I think, at about 232, down from 359 in March. Uh, and, um, you know, I think, you know, maybe one, maybe two more hikes and then, and then pause and just, you know, leave it there and, uh, let the economy grow, avoid financial crisis or, or be idiots and keep raising into a slowing economy and cause a great depression. I mean, your choice, but I think they're all coming to the conclusion as they see things break, uh, to, uh, that they're not going to be able to be the next Paul Volcker because when Paul Volcker raised rates up, he had a debt to GDP at 30%. We've got debt to GDP at 122%, and every full percentage point they raise rates adds $285 billion to the deficit each year. They've already added a trillion with the hikes they've, they've done, uh, and that's now approaching so Social Security line item. It almost costs us more to service the debt because of the hikes that they've done than it does to pay out all of Social Security every year. So how, how high do you want to go, Jay? Well, now, of course, investors are starting to ask, and I, I can't blame them for asking the question, why does it feel like the Fed raising the rates is having little to no effect on inflation? <laughs> you got it because it's supply driven. It's not demand driven. Like they, they kind of understand this and they think that, uh, well, the way to solve it then is just put a bunch of poor people out of work. I, I'll tell you one thing. You know, I think people would rather pay an extra 25 cents for a gallon of milk for the next three years than have no job. And I think, uh, you know, it's the lesser of two evils. You know, you increase money supply by five some trillion dollars in a year and a half. Granted, they had to do that. It was an emergency. Uh, but you're going to get inflation and, it, and it's going to come. And now money supply has been contracting uh, 18 months out. You're going to get deflation. And you, you're seeing already the reports of all of these department stores with record inventories, they're going to be blowing that stuff out at 50% off, 60% uh, off, 70% off. And you know what's the difference? To, I, I got to tell you, Mitch, I think it's absolutely hysterical. When Target marks their stuff down 50, 60, 70%, people are going to flock to the stores. When Walmart holds the clearance sale, people are going to flock to the stores. When the stock market holds the clearance sale, people are running through the stores like it's a fire in a movie theater. They're running out of the store. Uh, you've got Disney down 55%. No one wants to touch it with a 10-foot pole. The best bank in the world, JP Morgan, down 41%. You can't give it away. Uh, Boeing down 71%. Boeing has one competitor in the entire world. You think more people are going to be flying in three years or less people are going to be flying in three years. And at a 71% off of highs, you can't give the stock away. I'll tell you what. You're going to look back on some of these stocks, these high quality businesses that are at deep discounts two to three years from now and say, I missed a once in a lifetime or once, you know, twice or three times in one lifetime opportunity. But it doesn't happen often. You know, some of these things, the discounts you're getting, you haven't seen since 2008. Uh, some of them you've never seen. And, uh, and we're not talking about speculative uh, Momo stocks or, or small caps or micro caps that you're hoping for a home run. We're talking about Disney. We're talking about Boeing. We're talking about JP Morgan. We're talking about staples that have been here for decades, are going to be here for decades, and you still can't give them away. And it's that type of pessimism that creates these type of monster, unexpected rallies. And I think as, as you see earnings come through, you're going to see more buying power step in beyond the short covering 
in coming weeks and, and managers are going to find themselves off sides and have to panic buy with leverage just to catch their benchmarks into year end. Normally, I'm not the type of guy that asks this question, but I think today it's actually a good one. Where do you see the SPY around the year's end? Uh, all right. I, look, I, I mean, I, I'm not a trader. I'm an investor, but I, I will. I have spent a lot of time on this. Act. I think you're going to be around 4,250 to 4,300. And that's a, that's a minority view. And I'll tell you what, if the positioning is as offsides as I think it is, uh, you could potentially see higher. But in order to see higher than that, in the short term, you're really going to need to see good earnings guidance. And you're going to start to you're going to need to see the dollar going down. I think the most important thing today, two things that I'm looking at, Mitch. Number one is the U.S. dollar is down. That is good news because that's show, because of what we saw with the ECB. They're going to get dovish before us. So maybe now the dollar starts that the uh, euro starts to finally get a bid. You're seeing the British pound get a bid. If that dollar starts to come down, that's bullish. OK, you watch that. It's, and it's especially bullish for emerging markets. And, you know, I love uh, uh, one or two companies in China that, are, you know, have just been <laughs> sitting there for months. But they're going to they're going to start to move as that dollar comes down. Uh, and the second thing that I've been looking at is uh, high yield credit. Uh, and uh, today you're seeing HYG, J&K get bid. That means the credit markets are starting to function a little bit better. Uh, granted, one day doesn't make a trend. So let's see if we get some follow through in coming weeks. But I, I like this rally on worst case news. It means the sellers were exhausted ahead of the print. Now, what's going on in the labor markets? It seems like there's just something that maybe... Some people just don't understand. Well, look, the labor markets are still tight. I mean, jolts, you saw a little bit of easing uh, where the vacancies came down uh, a couple of weeks ago. And you'll see a little bit more of that because it all works on a lagged basis. Uh, but by and large, you know, employers, they don't want to really let people go because they had a, a, such a tough time hiring people. Uh, throughout this process. And, you know, the underlying economy, as much as GDP has slowed down and the Fed is trying to destroy the economy, I think they're going to blink before they do too much damage. You saw it today with the ECB. Uh, you saw it uh, last week with the BOE. Uh, the Fed is next. So I, I think unless they absolutely have to uh, let, employ, uh, let employees go, I think they're going to try to hang on to them as long as they can. And, um, and I think the Fed just needs to accept we're just going to run inflation above trend keep talking hawkish, but keep the actions light. And then we can avoid a crisis and, and just get through this little soft, soft spell and uh, onto bigger and better things. You know, the market is a discounting mechanism. It's, it's, it's not only discounted a soft spell, it's discounted a, a, a large recession. Uh, and as you know, markets bottom well before the, the recessions are ever declared. So what's next for us in the Fed? What do you think we'll be here? You know, I, I, it seems like uh, these guys get paid by the minute for going on TV because they, they, they spend an awful lot of time doing TV and I, I think uh, a lot less time reading history books and understanding the lag effects of their policy. But uh, my best guess is that, you know, you'll see them come out in November, probably do 50, maybe 75 if they want to, you know, create a little friction in the credit markets and then the credit markets will discipline them. Uh, so maybe one or two more hikes. I, I think the ideal situation for them is to come out, do 50 and, and put it on pause and say, we're going to watch the data. We can't control supply side. You look at, you know, all of the metrics related to the supply chain are improving. You know, there are no more really ships waiting at the L.A. port. It was down from like 120 to six. The last I looked, it's probably down to zero now. Uh, you look at cargo rates from China. They've just collapsed. They're down more than 75 percent. You look, you look at energy, things are improving. The things that are going to be sticky that have huge weights, like owners equivalent rent, they're going to be in the numbers for the next year. So if they're going to continue to tighten on the basis of lag numbers that are going to be sticky, uh, they're going to drive us into a depression. I think they're going to wind up blinking faster than everyone expects, just like ECB did today. Uh, but we'll, we'll know. I mean, my, guess, my best guess is 50 and, and done, or worst case scenario, 75, 50, then done. But the key is the market's sniffing out the end of the tightening. And if they want to leave rates elevated for some time and watch the data from there, that makes perfect sense. I mean, that, that's a, a sensible, rational way to go about things. I think just keep you know flooring it into a brick wall is going to be the problem. And I think they're probably getting some indications from seeing what's been happening in credit markets around the world that uh, might be time to downshift to fourth gear or third gear uh, before they hit the wall too hard.
So you can tell me if you agree with this, Thomas. Do you feel like we're closer towards the end than the beginning? For equity uh, correction? Yeah, for the correction yeah. and kind of no, the bear I, market. I, I do think so. I, I do think so. And, and the key thing you want to keep your eye on as the two tells is one, uh, the U.S. dollar, you want to see that stop going up. Uh, it doesn't have to correct or crash or anything like that. Just stop going up. Two, you want to see the 10-year yield stabilize around 4% and even start to move back. That would be a good sign. Watch the two-year yield. And then, of course, the most important is watch high-yield debt, uh, JNK, HYG. If those start to get bid, uh, then you can put most of this in the rearview mirror. But I will say, I know you love technicals. Uh, you know, I was texting with my friend in Europe this morning and I said, I think this is it. This was a beautiful leg sweep. It took out all the stop losses from retail, people that had the double bottom in mind. It just wiped them out this morning and then it just ran it up the road. And that's why you see so many angry people on Twitter today. Yeah. And I, I completely agree with it. That's kind of what I was looking at. It just seemed to me like if, if you were trying to get a definition for capitulation, this could have been it. Appreciate you coming on. Like always, Thomas Hayes, chairman and managing member at Great Hill Capital. It's always great to have you on, Thomas, and we'll have you back. Thanks so much, Mitch. And we're back. So uh, now I want to cover the article of the week. We went through that. This is the most important chart I'm watching. It's high yield credit spreads. And it's our view that the current credit disruption is an aftershock from 2020 like 2018, 2011, and 2005, not the beginning of a new earthquake like 2020, 2009, or 2002. So what you see here repeatedly uh, throughout history is you have these monster dislocations like in 2001 to 2003, then it comes down, and then you get these aftershocks like in 2005 uh, where spreads blow back up from 271 to 457, uh, or in 2011, where they blow back up from 452 to 910. And it seems like textbook that they basically double. The first aftershock right after the earthquake is a double. You know, 271 to 457, 452 to, to 910. Then you had uh, this one uh, in 2016 was like a half an earthquake. Then you had this aftershock from 316 to 554. And then you had an earthquake in 2020. And now we've gone from three to six, just about a double. This looks very much like 2011. And then the credit markets will start to normalize. Businesses will get refinanced and we're back off to the races. So this looks pretty solid. Um, and you can go through that. We covered... Uh, some of the rest of this on with Mitch, so I'm not going to repeat it again. The Fed Minutes Review, you can go through this at your leisure, but I think what Jeremy Siegel said about inflation is more valuable. And you see here, whether it's the PPI or the CPI, they're going in the right direction. Core CPI wasn't because of owner's equivalent rent, and Jeremy Siegel addresses that adequately in his clip. Uh, but by and large, this is a leading indicator PPI, and it's going in the right direction, albeit not at the right speed. But it's going to be that way. Just accept it's going to be above trend for years. The question is, does the Fed choose to accept it or do they not only get the inflation, but also an economic crisis that they can't afford on top of it? And I think they're now more leaning towards uh, doing the right thing. But we'll, we'll find out in coming weeks. Uh, you know, the sentiment, you know, I, I don't even need to tell you where it is. You can guess where it is. It's, it's at all time lows. I mean, it's at great financial crisis lows. And that's why you get a 900 point rally today. Uh, finally, uh, fear and greed was that extreme fear, duh. And then N A A I M. Uh, this this prints midday. Let's see what it got to. I'm gonna guess it's a lot less lower than, than 40. Um, it dropped to 19.84, 19.84. So these guys are toast. They are panic buying today into this strength. Now let's look at Carter's earnings here. Energy estimates are up 4.5 percent. Uh, for 2022 and 5.13% for 2023 in the last 60 days, but everyone's hiding under a bunker. Defense and aerospace earnings estimates, they're down 1.8% and 1.74% for 2023 in the last 60 days. The market's down 25% year to date. Earnings down 1.7%, give me a break. I mean, uh, REITs, uh, up, earnings estimates are up 1.54% and up 0.45% for next year. No one, you can't give away REITs 
and um, and and there you go. Next, um, utilities estimates are down nine tenths of a percent for this year, up one tenth of a percent for next year, and meanwhile the market's crashing. So when you sit back granularly, these are the top thirty weights of each sector. Earnings are holding up. Now we'll see. So they came down three and a half percent. Maybe it'll come down another two percent. Uh, remember, markets bottom with expanded multiples, usually not contracted multiples, because the E is supposed to go down during a recession. Uh, but we may, you know, we've already had a technical recession. We'll see how that plays out. Uh, very interested to see earnings. The bar is set exceptionally low. Uh, if you look here, the estimated growth rate is now only 2.4 percent for for next year. Uh, with inflation at six or seven, whatever the hell the number is, uh, they're basically saying earnings growth is going to be negative five percent. Which uh, it, it just just go to a restaurant for heaven's sake. You can't even get a table. So um, uh, we don't see that. Let's look at some of the economic data this week. We're seeing the Chinese pouring on more stimulus. Total Chinese uh, social financing came in much higher than expected, three point five uh, billion versus two point seven. Money stock M2 money growth is up 12.1% while ours is contracting. Outstanding loan growth is up 11.2%. New loans are up 2.4 billion versus 1.8 billion estimated. They're cranking it here, guys. Obviously, the shutdowns aren't helping, but I think that, that starts to moderate, even if not officially, after the China National Congress. Uh, PPI and CPI, Siegel covered all that. And um, jobless claims, I didn't even look at them today. They came in a little higher, so Powell will be happy. happy. More people are losing their jobs. And um, other than that, that's where we are. So tomorrow we've got bank earnings, which is going to be a big deal. And then, uh, and then we start to, to get in from the Fed talk market to the earnings talk and guidance talk market, which is the healthy market. Uh, moving forward. So with that said, I want to thank you for tuning in. We'll be back next week, same time, same place. In the meantime, oh, we have a couple AMA questions actually. One was, are you going to cover Alibaba earnings on the call? Well, they don't report for another few weeks, so but that is one potential catalyst. And then Matt Mitchell asked a question about position sizing. The max size we usually go for the highest conviction ideas is 20%. We did two of those this year. Um, and uh, we think they're going to work out just fine. Uh, generally smaller than that, but these are we're pound the table, uh, high conviction ideas, uh, and you got to just adjust it to your own temperament. Uh, go to terms, click on terms, and um, you know I don't know what your financial situation is, so but I know that for me, concentration is what produces uh, outsized returns over time. Uh, highly concentrated in high quality businesses that are temporarily out of favor and um, and that's how you make it it's lumpy but it's good and it works so with that said have a great week everyone we'll see you next week same time same place bye for now